Hello everyone, this is Gian. I'm back with the uh, second review of uh, Masters of the Universe Revelations Episode 2, which is the Poisoned Chalice, right? So it's sort of the beginning of the aftermath, right, of the death of uh, Skeletor and uh, He-Man at the end of Episode 1. So before we get started... <laughs> Hi, all yay! Hi, all yay! Yay, yay, Sunday. All right, mm -hmm. little kitty fan service. So, I found this episode. It's definitely, I guess you would say, a breather um, episode. It's very by the numbers action episode. It's it's meant to be the bridge, right, uh, between the the um, end of the first episode with, with the death of He Man and Skeletor, and is now you know sort of a Here's where we are now, right? It isn't explained, at least not in this episode. Maybe it's explained in the next three coming up. But it's not explained how long it's been since um, He-Man and Skeletor's death. We just see that, you know, their world is now without magic. Which is something that comes up a little later. So, uh, it's a fairly by-the-numbers episode. I found it pretty meh. To be honest, to be fair, not every episode is going to be, you know, huge and exciting, right? It's not going to be, you know, major twists and turns in every episode. I can understand why it's a bit more standard, given how the uh, first episode went, right? So, it picks up uh, several years later. It shows Tila and her friend Andra uh, excavating something there's some sort of trash dump or whatever and they fight some guy named uh, Stinkor to get some sort of item and of course you know they have that because they're in this very scary looking mask it's like it's actually very similar to what Psycho Mantis wore that gas mask in Metal Gear Solid if, you, if you've ever seen that or ever played that so it looks similar to uh, that so they look very spooky at first but then once the once the scene ends they have this somewhat comical scene where uh they're fighting, and by they, I mean Tila. Tila's fighting uh, Stinkor, and she sends him flying through the building, and he ends up crashing on, like, some little um, food cart or or something. It very much reminds me of, like, the whole running joke with, with the cabbage guy in Avatar. It's like, my cabbages! Right? That type of thing. So once they're sort of out and about, then they, you know, do the big reveal... They take off the mask and we see that, you know, this is uh, Tila's new look, right? In Tila's new life. Now, I've said everything that I can say about this design. I'm not going to belabor the point. It's already plenty of videos and even more tweets about it. And the war is still uh, raging online. Oh, dear God. But anyway. <coughs> so... Basically, more or less, what happens is that uh, Tila and her friend, believe me, yes, there is queer baiting. There are, there are two brief moments in this episode that are clear, clear uh, queer baiting, right? So what happens is that um, they get a job. They're mercenaries now, right? They're mercenaries now, and they get a job to retrieve this... Um, chalice from this like uh, quasi-religious um, cult-like group, right? I mean, the religious imagery is incredibly heavy, especially with, with, with the one like priest doing whatever he has, like the, the thing around his eyes. And he's talking about you out the salvation and being cleansed. And it's obviously meant to be very, 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 it's very on the nose. It's supposed to be like this religious cult dedicated to the machines as I guess sort of risen up um, in the absence of magic which in an odd way I, I, I can understand just if you look at how human history went right when people um, started losing faith in the church right people become more secular and they do sort of worship more material things or mechanical things right uh, especially as, as, as um, things with more humanist right the Renaissance and and stuff like like that. So in an odd way, I can actually understand why, in the absence of magic, right, that uh, the 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 people would start worshiping machines. 
right? But it's pretty obvious that this is a religious cult and, you know, that they're forcing people to convert, more or less, to drink this uh, poisoned chalice and, and, and to forcibly become these, like, half-human cyborgs, right? They have the thing with the eyes. It reminds me very much of Kano or the Terminator from the uh, Mortal Kombat games, right? So they break into this place. They're made to, uh, they, they break into this place. Tila, the whole, here's the thing. In the beginning, when they break into this place, I think it's on Snake Mountain, because they encounter this old woman who's obviously evil Lynn. It's clear as day it's evil Lynn. It's literally evil Lynn is a woman. I mean, as, a, as an old woman. Like, like the moment I looked at her, I was like, oh, it's evil Lynn aged like 50 years. But, so what happens <coughs> is that Tila and, and, and Andra are, are tasked by Evil Lynn in disguise to um, go get this poisoned uh, chalice, right? So, Andra's all up to do it. Tila's not so much, but um, uh, what's her face? Evil Lynn plays on her emotions by explaining in her disguise that, you know, this item is, is precious to her because it belonged to her best friend and he's gone. It's pretty obvious from the language, from the way the scene plays out, is that this is supposed to, you know, soften Tila's heart, right? Play on her emotions. Which I would actually be okay with if we ever actually saw her emotions being played with. One of my biggest issues with this episode is how it was voice acted. And honestly, how it was animated. Tila never once, excuse me, Tila never once in this episode comes across as sincerely sad or missing Adam or missing anything about her former life. There's this one scene where she's standing in front of the gates of, um, uh, of Snake Mountain, right? And... She's staring at the gate and, and she's supposed to be reminiscing about some fight that she and He-Man were involved with together, right? Yet, her expression never changes. Her expression is completely neutral. And even when her friend Andra, you know, comes over and it's like, how are we going to break into this place? Tila's voice, it, you never hear it crack. You never hear any sadness, right? Again, her, her emotional... And again, I I don't blame Sarah Michelle Geller for the voice acting issues. But the emotional display, both in her visuals and in her voice, is simply one note. It is just anger. It's not, a, and I'd rather say it's just righteous anger, right? It's not even like notes or flavors to, to anger. It's just simply righteous anger. And nothing else. Not sadness. Not regret. Not guilt. Not doubt. Just simply righteous anger. Tila's right. Right? And no one ever really questions her or challenges her on how she feels. But I will admit that there's a very touching scene between her and Cringer um, at the end. I think that that scene should have been a bit more private. It shouldn't have been taking place literally in front of uh, Andra and Evil Lynn and, and the Sorceress. But but uh, I do... That scene was, was probably the best scene in the show. And it's really because of Cringer's voice actor and the way Cringer was um, uh, animated, right? He's sincerely trying to appeal to whatever little bit of good nature that this abomination of Tila still has left. He really is trying to appeal to, to the better side of herself. And yes, the part of her that does miss Adam. The problem is that she never acts like a woman. Hell, she never acts like a person who is sincerely, deeply missing another person. Right? She never acts like that. She never comes across as sincerely missing Adam or missing her old life. Or anything. It's just, I am angry. I was lied to. I am angry. I was lied to. Nothing else. That's the, that, that is just like the, the one emotional note she has displayed in these two episodes, right? I'm angry. I'm righteously angry. I was lied to. As if 
you know, the king wasn't lied to or other people. The majority of, the, of, of Eternia didn't know Tila. You act like you, you were left out on purpose when you weren't. But anyway, <coughs> so <coughs> Tila does eventually figure out that the woman she's working for is Evil Lynn. And um, Evil Lynn is able to talk her into uh, sort of working uh, for her. So they go to this uh, place where, where they have the sorceress. And the sorceress is shown to be a lot old, older looking now. She's very physically weak. And she explains that she, due to circumstances, has to entrust the last bit of magic on Eternia to Evil Lynn of all people. I'm, I'm assuming it's because Evil Lynn is maybe the last magic user or the last really powerful one. Because my first thought is, okay, but you know Orko. Orko can use magic. But maybe it's a matter of, of you know, maybe among everybody that, that is left that, this, that uh, Evil Lynn is, is, is the strongest one there. I don't quite know. It's not really explained why she chose Evil Lynn. But they play it as sort of a uh, strange bedfellows type situation. Evil Lynn even asks the uh, sorceress, why do you trust me? And the sorceress is like, I trust our mutual interests. Right? So, it's, so it's not a matter of, of she necessarily thinks that Evil Lynn has changed in a, in a moral sense. Right? So it's basically explained at, at the end that uh, they have to go to heaven and hell. They have to go to Subternia and Preternia um, to retrieve the the diff, the two halves of the Sword of Power and reforge it. And Andra literally says, oh, they're sending us to, to heaven and hell. I'm like, can we please stop being so painfully blatant? Can we please? I understand exposition to a certain point. I understand that you have to let the audience know what's going on, but these type of things like, oh, they're sending us to heaven and hell. It's like, do you think that you're, that the person watching this is so dumb as to not realize what preternia and subternia are? You literally needed a character to literally state, they're sending us to heaven and hell. You're sending me to heaven and hell. But anyway, and yeah, um, that's about it. There's nothing really to it. Other than that, when they're in the uh, uh, the quasi religious cult that's dedicated to the to the machines, Tila, it's just the Tila show. I know some people have taken issue with that, uh, with with that particular scene because she just kicks butt and takes names. But the way I look at it is this: first of all, it's definitely inspired by Batman. If you've ever played the Batman Arkham games, you know how everybody like runs and jumps Batman and he's, and he's able to find various moves and ways to defeat everybody attacking him, right? So it's definitely an ode to Batman. There's even a scene where she uses this like grappling gun type device, right? I'm like, oh, okay, she's, she's just Batman in this scene. This is definitely an ode to the, to the Batman clearing house Right, kicking butt, taking names, action scene. So that's why I'm not too bothered by it. They try to justify by by, you know, Tila's the warrior, right? She's the former captain of the guard. You never actually see her fighting to this point, but you know, that's sort of how it's justified because of her military history. It's not the best scene. I kind of wish that there had been a bit more thought and creativity put into defeating all of the um I guess you could say priest or whatever it is, but I can live with it. I mean, it's a very standard action cartoon, action hero thing for the action hero. And look at this. Tila's certainly the action hero here. She's definitely the unstoppable action hero. It's a very standard action hero cartoon thing to to have the the hero, you know, be the person to beat everybody up in a room, right? Everybody can attack them. But nobody can defeat them. So, standard trope. I can live with it. I wish it has actually stayed more to what they were doing in the beginning, where they're sort of like sneaking around. But there is one scene where they like, literally, there's, there's, there's like a line of like, uh, mecha priest, right? And um, 
uh, Tila and Andra literally get behind them and they like put them in a chokehold and they take two of them. And I'm like, you're literally telling me that that these people, this 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 isn't like oh they jumped two priests who got lost or, or separated or something and pulled them away. I right, no no no. They literally run up behind them, this whole group of people, and pull these two people away. I'm like, you're telling me no one in that small pack of people heard the boots, heard the shuffling, heard, you know, garble like, rah, rah, rah. like nothing, no, they heard nothing of two people literally behind them being choked out and dragged away. That particular part made, made no sense to me. It's one of those things where it's like, it's cool in a video game, but doesn't really work <laughs> in like animation or live action. But outside of that, the whole that whole um, fight scene, I was okay with. But um, yeah, I mean, as an episode, I found it meh. I found it very standard. It's not great, but it's not awful. But yeah, it definitely establishes that Tila is indeed the uh, action hero protagonist in this in the second episode this is definitely the Tila show now I want to share if you guys don't mind I want to share my uh, notes that I took on this episode so here are the notes as they were written as I was watching the show oh wonderful redesigned Tila is here Tila worked worked with Orko but now disavows magic <laughs> old lady is obviously evil Lynn can't Tila see that? Evil Lynn mentioning dead friend obviously plays on Tila's emotions. Flashback was nice, but hollow. No emotion. The cyber priest didn't hear Tila in Andra attack? I like that they are using stealth on Snake Mountain so far. The, oh, the 3D. Yeah, yeah. They at times use 3D imagery in this scene. Like, like there's a scene where there's very frightened man is made to drink from the poison chalice and the 3d is like it's like the black me mechanical water i guess you could call it is in there and it's in and it's very um 3d 3d in, the, in, in this show is awful the 3d graphics in the show are atrocious <coughs> it looks very 1990s very bad 1990s right Motherboard is a religion cult now. Why does Tila hold Andra's hand? Is Tila Batman because she can take on a whole horde of attackers? Tila is Batman, has a grapple hook. Old lady, really evil Lynn, pops up out of nowhere and states that Tila quit. And Tila hands over Chalice without asking how she knew that. Is she dumb? Yes, I think she's very dumb. <laughs> Why isn't Tila asking how the hell old, old lady knows about her past? Yes, there is queer baiting. Because here's, here's the reason why I say that. Because there's a scene when Andra and Tila are, are breaking into the quasi-religious cult. And uh, Tila is basically about to attack, right? And she literally, like, she does this, right? She takes Andra's hand and she squeezes her fingers just like this. Anybody who's been in a romantic relationship knows how intimate that is, right? To take someone's hand and squeeze it like this, right? And then there's the scene that I think most most people have, have seen the clip of, you know, where uh, Tila's literally got her arm hooked around Andra's uh, shoulders. I'm like, yeah, I have plenty of female friends. I don't hug any of them like that. I don't even hug any of my male friends uh, like that. So yeah, there is, at least in this episode, there is definite queer baiting here. It is subtext. It's not like there's any dialogue, at least as of yet, that indicates that there's an attraction or anything between Tila and Andra. But the way it's animated, I would say, is the subtext. Again, women don't act like that. <laughs> women who are just friends don't hug each other that way and they don't squeeze each other's hand. We don't hold each other's hands unless you're a mother holding the hand of your child or maybe you're, you're like an adult and you're holding your elderly parent's hand or, or, or an elderly person's hand. But outside of that, no, that ain't happening. So yeah, there is, there is in my opinion, queer baiting, right? So there's that. So continuing. 
For a woman who is supposed to be torn up over Adam's death, Tila does not sound or act like it. Finally, Tila realizes who the old woman is. The old woman is Evil Lynn. Really, sorceress, Evil Lynn can't be trusted. Tila never acts suspicious of anything she hears. Tila, Evil Lynn, and the sorceress aren't. Aren't. Oh, sorry. Tila, Evil Lynn, and the sorceress aren't the royals. They didn't lie to you. And then there's this one thing, which is where this image comes from, where, <coughs> where um, Tila objects and she's like, I've built a life of truth. And I'm like, life of truth? You just stole a chalice for evil and you aren't a moral person. <laughs> and then, uh, one second. Make up your mind, RJ. Where do you, in or out, come on. Then it says, too, now I have uh, too much exposition. Cringer Tila conversation, this, this is toward the end, is very nice, but should have been a more private scene. Right, so I think that they really should have drawn an extra scene where, like, Cringer and Tila find them themselves alone, right? Maybe in a separate room or something, and then they have that conversation about, you know, the, the Tila just really being hurt and upset that that He-Man died and that, you know, um, He-Man trusted her to, you know, look, uh, to take, take care of things in the event of his death and all that. It's a very touching scene. I, I just don't think it, there should have been witnesses in, in this case. Why doesn't Tila tell Andra that, for, that forging the sword is personal and she's not going on this journey with her? All right, so those were my thoughts as I watched the episode. I have expressed my thoughts here uh, about the episode, both during and after. And yeah, so very meh, very by the numbers. So the Tila show is starting off pretty mediocre. We'll see what season, what season, what episodes three, four, and five provide. Hey, that rhymes. But anyway, please let me know what you think, and I will see you all in the next one. Have a good day and night wherever you are. Bye.